Hey, it's uh, Benjamin Ray here. Today, I am with Erin Overly, and she is the president of wavepool.io. How are you? I'm doing good today, Ben. How about yourself? Excellent. I'm, I'm really happy that you're, you're on the show today talking about sustainability. And a, a little story here, you know, you and I met probably a couple months ago, and there was a video that I did uh, just around sustainability and trash around my house. I went down to Cherry Creek here in Denver, which you know of, and I counted 74 pieces of trash, big pieces of trash that were just on the ground, like that somebody had discarded. And I think you saw that video and then we had a conversation and it, and it really became clear that something can be done about it or what can be done about it. So after that, then, you know, I'd been doing videos, I guess, since uh, February on sustainability. But that after that, I was really inspired to start talking to a lot more people about it. You know, what can we do about it? Is there a solution? Is it consumers? Is it retail? Is it manufacturers? And we had that that big Zoom call with, I think there were about 20 people on it where we had some really insightful conversations and learned a lot about, you know, just the challenges around finding sustainable packaging and what we can do to actually reduce packaging waste. And that led to this. And now we are here in the, you know, episode 13. And I'm really happy uh, that you kind of started on that journey, but yours goes way back. And so if you could talk a bit about kind of your, your path and how you got to where you are being very concerned about reducing packaging waste, be a great place to start. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so I would say I'm no sustainability expert by any means, um, but I am passionate. And I think passion goes a really long way when it comes to controversial topics like this. Um, it started for me probably seven years ago. There was a Morgan Spurlock show on documentary on where does your trash go? And I watched it and I was just my jaw dropped, my stomach was sick. It was just so beyond what I what I knew. And knowing what now I know, I was just like, this is a major issue. It, it reminds me of a necklace that's tangled and you're trying to like figure out which piece can untangle the other piece. That's what I would describe this whole industry about because there's so many different advocate or avenues to look at it um, but there's also so many different players at hand, uh, between government to passionate people like myself to the actual, um, producers of the packaging. Um, so yeah, it started there and then it morphed into a passion around, you know, different ways that I could become more sustainable in my own life. Um, so how did you find that show for, first of all, you know, you were, was it just kind of some self-education? Did somebody refer it to you? And describe a little bit about what, what changed for you when you saw that, that show. Yeah, so I've always been a tree hugger at heart. So it's kind of been in my nature to, to look at things with the eyes of, is this good for the planet? Um, this was just a happenstance clicking through some TV channels. I think it was like on A&E way back in the day when I had cable. Now it's all streamed <laughs> through different apps, but um, it just popped up and didn't know anything about Morgan Spurlock at all, but just was intrigued by the, just the opening scene. And I just began to just get captivated more and more by this entire storyline of when he takes the trash all the way to the curb follows the trash truck all the way to the dump, to the landfill, from the landfill, where does it go from there? And it just kind of spiraled into this like, oh my gosh, now it's in our oceans and we're consuming it. And it's, whoa, it's way bigger than I expected. So it's not just like you say, like like I've said, oh, I've got this recyclable container. I'm taking it out. I'm putting it in the, you know, the bin. I've done my part, you know, like then right. what? Then what happens to it? Right. And I think that's the thing is a lot of us, especially in um, first world countries, we don't get to see where it goes. In third world countries, you're you're seeing it on the ground. You're seeing it in, you know, on beaches and big landfills. You're seeing seagulls around it um, from the trash that has just been produced off of consumable goods. And for me, that was just an eye opening experience because um, 
it's it's not just here in the states it's a global issue and that issue can become solvable <laughs> but it's going to take a lot of different variables for us to get to untangling that necklace at, at the end of this i'm going to ask you what's your how you're going to solve it but you know we'll go go back to the uh, education piece was that you saw this video and you were like wow i had no idea it was such a big problem and that kind of led into uh just being more self-educated and did you seek out more information or how did you actually become educated on really what the challenges are? Um, so it took just a lot of digging. Um, and what's hard is when you start digging on these types of things, you start to get very controversial um, messages. And I think the biggest thing is in this journey, especially on that show, he started doing digging like, well, how do we solve this? How, how do we get out of this just throw trash away and it just lives inside the earth or it's living on the surfaces of the earth? And um, there, there's technologies that are out there. There are people trying to solve it in different ways. And I think it's uncovering those different types of um, means to, to transition your, your way of thinking it's a paradigm shift. It's instead of going to the grocery store and I see a, two packages, I see one that's made of bamboo and I see one that's made of plastic. I'm going to choose the one with bamboo. And now we can go into an, a whole nother concept of, well, that bamboo came from Asia, which is flying over to the United States to finally get to where we need it to be. Um, but at the same time, the plastics lifespan is so much longer. So, kind of looking at the full carbon footprint, they all have different scales of what it's doing to our planet. Um, but I think the longevity of what's happening with plastic in our world, um, and that panel in itself was an eye-opening experience. That was an education piece for me. Like we had a lot of people that are in the industry of packaging our food and our consumable products, whether it's, you know, a headset or, you know, scissors that's wrapped in plastic that drives me nuts, just so you know, because I always cut myself on the plastic. Um, that doesn't use really scissors to, yeah, <laughs> scissors to cut the plastic. Yes, it's just, it's ridiculous. But um, it was an eye opening thing to know that there's reasons why plastics in our environment and then having, was it Melissa? Was she the, um, she was the one that was explaining that there's yeah. an ecosystem around how much plastic you need to have in our, in our working world. And then there's other different types of sustainable packaging that can be used in other ways. And so I think it's all balance. And I think that's um, what we're trying to uncover is what does that balance look like and what other alternatives are there? Um, so education to me was just doing the work, digging, looking at what, what products are you consuming? And from that consumption, what is it doing? Who are they supporting? What are they doing to the environment as they're creating the, the products that they are? Um, and as you start to go down that, that whole hole, it'll take you a while. It's taken me many years. Um, it'll start to change your heart. It'll make you more aware. So, so when you say controversial, why do you say that, that it's a controversial issue? If everybody doesn't like plastic waste or waste and you see trash, why is that controversial to find solutions to get away from it? I think it's controversial because, um, hold on, I have to sneeze. I didn't realize I was going to sneeze live. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm trying it's to live. Yeah, it's <laughs> um, no, I, I say it's controversial because it's so unknown still. And when something's unknown, we, we tend to not know what how how to approach it um and part of that education piece is you know there's different classes of education even within the united states that people are aware of you know certain products that are good for you or you know certain health you know how do you maintain your health that's that's all education um and when you say it's controversial or and i say it's controversial i think it's controversial because there are people that are out there that do still believe plastic is a good solution for some products. Is it the is it the the saving grace for all products? No. Is plastic water bottles great? I don't think so. I think there's alternatives out there that can make, you know, can sustain the life of a water 
or keeping water clean and sustain its delivery method that it needs to go into. Um, but it doesn't need to keep in our environment for as long as it does. Um, and so I, I think that that's why I say it's controversial is because there's different viewpoints that people have around plastic and certain sustainable packaging that they're just, it's kind of like anything else. It's everyone has a view on it and that's why it's controversial. Yeah, I guess if you, if you are in the business of making plastic bottles and there isn't really, you know, your business has been around 70 years, uh, you're in the business of doing that, you're going to want to either perpetuate that or you're going to try to, you know, educate the consumer on why plastic may be better. I think the fact is there's just so much plastic waste out there that even if you're a company that believes in it and you want to change, it's going to take a long time for, well, Americans specifically to change their habits. And I would say that it is controversial in the fact that a lot of people just don't, they don't want to become educated on it and they take the easy road and just say, well, it's status quo, you know, I'm not going to go out of my way or, or they don't even think like that. They just think, look, I bought this for my whole life. It's fine. You know, they don't really think about it. So that educational piece, whether that's self-awareness or if it's kind of a we thing, you know, that society needs to do this is huge um, um, about how do you go around then? How do you educate people? What's the best way? You know, so. Well, the awareness piece, I'd like to get into that a little bit with you. So once you understood the problem and the challenge, you mentioned about going into stores and kind of looking, how has that changed your life now that you're aware of all the, the packaging waste? Um, it's changed my life in the sense that when I purchase a product, I look at the, lo the longevity of that product in my life. Um, so if I'm going to buy a jar of marinara sauce, that jar is going to be a part of my life, whether it becomes a candle, whether it becomes a storage container for other foods that I make down the road. Um, I, I'm a, I hate to go and purchase more Pyrex because there's so much already in what we're consuming that we can use. Um, but it's also made me aware that we're just at the tip of the change. Um, not a, there's still more to be done. Um, and I think it comes back to just educating myself on why certain packages are packaged with certain products. Um, and I think when it comes to even clothing, that's a whole nother topic around sustainability because I, I, I wanna say it was that same show they were talking about how we used to have four seasons of fashion. Now we have 54 seasons of fashion and the fashion industry is just taking off with slashing prices and just ditching clothes. And that just breaks my heart because that's waste that just wasn't needed to, to pollute. Like mm -hmm. it, it, it's not necessary. Um, and I think that there's lots going on within our environment right now, and that's another controversial uh, topic as well, that we need to be more mindful. And I think that mindfulness as you're going through the grocery store is not just, okay, this works, that works. Okay, yep, they like that. And then you talk about kids and the marketing around kids and labeling. Um, that could be a change in how we look at plastic and our other packaging as in itself, because kids are sponges they love to know things and that's why marketing campaigns around putting the cereal boxes super low so that when they're at the aisles they're picking off the the right cereal for themselves um, has worked and i think if we look more back at our youth and kind of changing that um, perspective early on i think the change can start to really take shape moving forward um, because that awareness is now embodied in a, a young child that is being educated on why they should choose a certain product because they've been educated on it. When I, when I grew up, everything was about plastic. It was just, you know, it's just what, what we had. Um, a lot of people watching the show, the same thing. In fact, we've got a, a comment here uh, from Ian 
Stanley has plastic injection molding company for food packaging. You know, we've we've all had packaging. In fact, me being in marketing, I was talking about the other day, marketers were the first one 50 years ago, you know, like the Mad Men type to say plastic is amazing. And it's something that every American needs. And so it's interesting now that we as marketers now can promote, you know, searching for alternatives. Um, I want to address this here too. These are these are good uh, comments here for me and alternatives that biodegrade quicker are high, hard to find. And we have seen over the past couple of months in these conversations that the cost is higher right now. And until it's less expensive, way more so, I don't think that Americans are going to choose to do it. Because if we're spending marketing dollars to educate consumers on why it's better, that money could be spent on investing in innovative technologies to actually bring the price down so that when you go into a store, you don't have to be aware. You don't have to be thinking about it. You just say, wow, this one is, I'll buy it. And it just happens to be sustainable. So, right. you know. No, and I think to that point, you know, it goes back to the, the tangled necklace. There's so many different variables around who is responsible. Is it me as a consumer having to go educate myself or is it we as an entire species looking at it with a different viewpoint and trying to do it all together um you you then bring in government and then if they put you know laws in place or taxes in place fees in place on those types of plastics or consumable products that you know are very wasteful then you know that's a whole nother topic to talk about. But hey, weren't, weren't you, weren't, were you saying one time that, that a couple places, was it somewhere in Oregon and Boulder here, that they do have some programs like that? Yeah, so if you go to Portland, um, and California just passed a law around plastic bags, because um, that was a real big um, issue around waste and sustainability. But Portland, if you don't go into a store and you don't have a bag, they charge you $5 for a paper bag, and they don't have any, any plastic bags. Um, and same thing with California. They just passed a law, I want to say like about five years ago. So you're seeing communities change. You're seeing it happen, but it's not happening fast enough here in the States. You're seeing it in European countries change. Um, and I think the conversation talking about awareness is that the fact that we're even having the conversation is really where it starts. It's really getting people to think differently. It's you know sharing stories of why my journey has started the way it has, so that people then it touches the lives of others. Your story around plastic that you saw in Cherry Creek touched my heart because, guess what? That's been something that's top of mind of mine for about this last seven years. So, I think we all have a role and a and a place to play in this con conversation. Um, it's just you know. I think it's it's multiple pronged approaches to how we get there. It's going to take a lot of cooperation, you know, whether it's whether it's the manufacturers, whether it's the retail, whether it's the consumer. And I think these conversations from what I've seen, uh, I don't know if they're helping, but it's I'm certainly starting to see all the challenges. And once we can identify the challenges, it's much easier then to connect the dots and come up with solutions. So. You know, my, my belief is over the next five to 10 years, there are going to be uh, people within companies who are kind of brand champions of sustainability, not just, you know, sustainability chiefs or corporate social responsibility people, but everybody within some, a lot of people within companies will say, hey, let's try to do something about this and then say, okay, what are we going to do? Well, they may know somebody on the retail side, manufacturing side, consumer side, and start to have these conversations that will start to impact in smaller ways across the country for you know maybe their empowerment zones or their tax breaks or their fines or whatever that is like you know talk about controversial you know kind of like cigarette tax you know on bags if you use a bag you get taxed you know i mean there are there are a lot of things that that will bring up i suppose a lot of controversy but you know that's really the only way that things are going to get done because otherwise people are just going to not have alternatives and we're just going to it's we're going to rely on on people like us who just believe that, you know, it's better. But that's a very small minority right now of people, as we saw in that big panel discussion that we did. So, well, that leads me into action. So now that you're educated and now that you're aware, what are you specifically doing and what do you think that we all can do outside of having conversations to get people going? 
So action is just like I said, it's, you know, starting with education. That's part of the action. It's, you know, educating yourself, the awareness when you're going into even a Nordstrom or a uh, a Whole Foods, yes, you might be going into a natural grocery store, but it doesn't mean that the packaging has changed. Um, it's really looking at everything with that fine comb um, and being aware that what what your what your choice is is going to have consequences, unfortunately, and that how long will that consequence last in your footprint? Um, and I think for me, the action that I've begun to really start to hone in on is how can I be a bigger voice and megaphone to people that have influence? And that's why, you know, Wavepool, the company that um, and the platform we are creating is around um, connecting leaders. Those leaders can make a difference. And I think it's just being able to have the conversation and being able to really talk about it with your children and, you know, educate yourself, but educate your kids, educate um, people that, you know, might not have a good understanding just saying, you know, that that's a great choice for a, a great brand, but this brand might have a better impact on the world, you know, and um, that to me in the hippie world that I live in is something that I think could go a long way. Um, if you look at just how quickly the food industry changed when gluten-free became or celiacs became a really big issue. Vegans became more loud about their stance on what they wanted and needed in the market. This too can have that same balance to it um, because there's innovation there. There's, there's things to be done. It just has been untapped and um, it's going to be it's going to be a step-by-step -step process. It's going to take a minute for us to get there, but it's going to have to be loud. Mm. Yeah. You know, this, um, it is going to take some time, as Brad says here. Thanks for that comment. I'm going to bring up a thing here that, that Ian said also is that, you know, if people, um, and his company's been around 70 years, if they would have known just family business, the damage that it would cause now, they may have done something about it. And really what that says to me is, it, you know, we can just start now. So, you know, we can't look in the past. We can't say we should have done this. You know, we can say today, here's what I'm going to do. And here's the action that I'm going to take today. And if we think about how are we going to affect positively what the world's going to be like, not tomorrow or not 10 years or even 20 years, but let's say 100 years, 200 years, 400 years, if, if we shift to that mentality, I think we would start to make different choices. Uh, you know, understanding that every action that we take matters for what the future is going to be like. And if we shift to that mentality, then it is education, awareness and action all at the same time. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a, a comment here. This is kind of a, a longer one here. Um, and this is this is from Michael here. Collective capitalism through agro technology, relocalize agriculture is the first component to secure. And, you know, I think we can get very deep uh, in this, and that may be uh, something for the next conversation. Uh, Michael, just so you know that all these comments are addressed afterward. And so thank you for participating in this conversation. Um, so the action then that you would recommend really for all of us and kind of the solution that we were talking about at the beginning would be what? If you would have everybody do one small thing today, then something that would affect five to 10 years, then something that would affect 400 years down the road, what would that be? What would those things be? So I'd be, it would first just be aware. Um, when you're picking up a product, really look at it, inspect it, identify what components are to that package, um, and look at what your options are when you're at the, at the grocery store or at any store. Um, and then from there, even looking at your behavior, I think it really takes an inward look and reflection of yourself to identify the change. Um, the behavior in a lot of us is that we need more. We need it. We, we got to have that next thing. We got to have that new iPhone. We've got to have, we got to have. And with that, and it's driven by the market, you know, it's driven by the new releases and, you know, the new new clothing brand line that just came out 
if we could do more inward looking of, do we really need that? Do I really need to have that? That action is going to go so much farther in those years to come because I've hold, I've held on to things that I've had since I was a teenager clothes that I'm like, it's just so cute. I can't let it go. And maybe down the road I can fit back into it. Um, and then I do, and then it somehow works out, but, and I didn't need to go to a store to go do that. Um, it's looking at your, your food options. Do you really need to get cilantro in a plastic bag or can it just be in the bundle? Mm. You know, those little things make a difference. Um, but it definitely comes from an action wise. It comes inward. Look at yourself, look at what, what you're needing and identify what those things are. And I promise you, it's not going to be what you think. So it may be something about when you're when you're just shopping, uh, don't just go for what's cheap. Say, you know, I'm, I'm going to spend more on this knowing that it's going to last you 10 years. So buy higher quality goods that support the environment. And it doesn't have to be, as you in your words, tree hugger looking. You know, it can be oh. there are a lot of companies that are doing really, you know, innovative stuff with some some good fabrics. But just educate yourself on that and really invest in yourself as opposed to just say, I need to have whatever's cheap today, because I pretty much guarantee that if you buy, you know, one shirt for $10, as opposed to 10 shirts, you know, over 10 years that cost a dollar each, you you will save that longer because the value's there and you'll, you'll like it. Here's, a, here's an action thing I wanted to put up from Ian, uh, speaking of directly of action. So if we pay 10 cents for a grocery bag in California, what if this 10 cents can go towards alternative use? And that that's an interesting concept because then people would say, okay, I am paying more for this, but I know where it's going to go. It's almost like any bond measure that's passed, you know, you add a, a penny onto some sales tax. Usually they don't pass because people don't know where that, that goes, you know, transportation mm -hmm. typically you're in Colorado. So if, if it is, I'm going to pay extra for this, knowing that that's going to go to something to support this. I think that's a, a good place to start for sure. I'd agree. This um, this uh, comment from Michael is interesting. A virtual wholesale retail market. You know, that's another idea. And, and I do want to say that that over coronavirus there have been a lot more things that have gone online, like this meeting here, that will shake out to be beneficial in terms of understanding this because now a lot of people can get together from wh whatever side you're on this equation whether you are a 70 year old plastic manufacturer of, of food containers or if you're on the other side and you buy bulk and you bring in your own containers i think that there's some very healthy conversations that can come out of this and and not necessarily healthy debate uh, meaning controversial like I don't want to talk to you and I don't want to talk to you. I think there's genuine interest in people wanting to find solutions, especially once you become more educated and self-aware when you say, you know, I want to do something not just for me, but for my kids and for my grandkids and my grandkids' kids. You start to think differently about that. And that's when innovation and solutions um, occur is when we start to think multi-generationally and how can we disrupt what we're doing now and come up with some better solutions. Yeah, I have to agree with you, Ben. And I think um, it's showing itself in the smallest ways already. And I think it's also showing itself in in the larger scope. If you look at even just the campaign for the presidency, it's uh, it's loud. It's happening. It's something that's reached the top. And I think the fact that it's even on the conversation of the top is a big deal. Um, mm -hmm. And that no matter where you stand, it's a topic of conversation that is ready for change. Yeah, I mean, we are a disposable society here in North America, primarily Americans. So it's a disposable society. You mentioned something about, you know, Europe is kind of doing better and they're doing, I'd say, better in many ways in terms of being aware about this stuff. And it is going to take some time and it is going to take a lot of people doing a lot of hard work. But I see that as an opportunity to innovate. I agree. Well, I'm wondering how can people get a hold of you if they want to continue this conversation, uh, not only to learn more about uh, your your wave pool uh, venture. Uh, what what is that? That that's uh, that is uh, a new company and it's about empowering women. Can you talk a little bit about that 
in IT? Yeah, so Wavepool is a, a new venture that myself and my business partner have decided to go down. Um, I'm a big, so it, it kind of spurred from the fact that we connect IT leaders nationally um, in person. And a lot of that has changed over the course of the pandemic. And what we identified was that there's a gap right now in helping women in technology and people of diversity connect to some other leadership within their organization. And so Wavepool, think of yourself waving to a pool of your peers, is a platform that's helping other leaders bring up their next kin of leaders and um, really helping them you know, in crisis situations and or just contributing to the dialogue around some of the things that they're focused on. Um, but it's a, it's a program and a tool that's going to help leaders um, talk about some of the controversial things that are happening in their own world around um, IT. And that's exciting for me because I think that's another conversation around sustainability is there's, there's, there's a lot to be had there. And um, we're really excited for Wavepool. Well, we are seeing a lot more companies hiring chief sustainability officers and, you know, corporate social responsibility is a big issue now. And if it's not a part of any small or large company going into the next strategically into the next five or 10 years, I think they're missing out on a lot of opportunity to, you know, kind of draw a line in the sand, sand and say, here's what we believe and here's what we're going to do. If you don't, if you don't talk about that, I think, you know, people are going to say that you don't have a plan and maybe companies yeah. don't, but even me just saying this now, you know, I hope to inspire some people to say, um, yes, um, we need to do this or we need to at least think about it. So it's not, so you're talking with Melissa, it's not just greenwashing. It's actually, here's what we're doing. And we would like to be in the conversation, you know, so I've got exactly. a, a comment here about Michael about freedom of debate, debate. And that is true. Like Jim Peters model, um, you know, good to great. Healthy debate always brings about, um, you know, innovation to move forward. So your email at Wavepool, what is that? It's um, Aaron at Wavepool.io. So my name is spelled a little different. It's E-R-Y-N-N at Wavepool.io. And LinkedIn, you're on LinkedIn, so people can send you a direct message if they want to talk to you directly, yes. right? Yep. Connect with me on LinkedIn. DM me if you have any questions. Happy to be a resource to you in your exploratory of um, exploration of you know sustainability and the journey you're awakening to. Well, great. Well, I really appreciate your comments and passion around, and I appreciate everybody's comments. Uh, I will address those after the show here, but thank you again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone.